Okay. See, test, okay. So everybody can hear me fine? Um, I guess we'll get this started. Um, my name is Steve Grubb. I work in the uh, RHEL security um, group. Uh, normally I work on uh, audit system, common criteria, FIPS, and lots of other uh, boring things. And uh, you know, a lot of the talks that I would give is really aimed at uh, system administrators. And so I was trying to think, you know, what can I do that's security related that might be interesting for developers? And so I, I thought that, you know, I would um, sort of talk about this, this, uh, this project and this, uh, this journey I took, you know, to, to learn about this, uh, to, um, you know, enlighten, maybe inspire, you know, some other people to, to do something similar. So in terms of security, this is going to be like, the potato chips or the Doritos version of security. You know, it's not gonna, it's gonna be light and, and, uh, and fun. It's not gonna be heavy and, uh, and filling. Okay, so the, the, way I, the way I got into this whole thing was I saw this clip on, on the internet uh, for this product called EmoSpark. And I don't know, has, has anybody seen or heard of this thing? Okay. It is not really intended to be a commercial for them, but uh, I think it would be beneficial if I give you a little bit of a, a view of what it, what it is. Hal, what's the Lakers score? The Lakers are beating the Celtics 90 to 80. Would you like me to let you know the score at the end of the fourth quarter? Yeah, that'd be great. And so, you know, I saw that and I was thinking to myself, holy cow, you know, here we are, you know, it's in the, the mid 2010s and has computers really progressed that far, you know, that uh, this stuff is, is really common now and is this kind of stuff really far-fetched? And, um, you know, so I, I decided, you know, to do some investigating to see, you know, if something like that is, is something that can be made easily. Let me go back into this. So, you know, the first thing I thought was, well, this thing is, is basically an IRC bot, you know, where, uh, you know, it, it has something on the back end, you know, running things. So I started looking at different uh, IRC bot uh, frameworks, you know, Perl, uh, C plugin, uh, Python. And so, you know, I thought, well, that's, that's interesting, but that's really going to be a lot, of, a lot of typing and hard coding, you know, of things if I'm going to go that way. So then, you know, I run across something called uh, ChatScript, which, you know, sounded like this is a, a little bit better. It's a little more in the ballpark. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, I was still searching. And so, you know, I found an answer, you know, on Stack Overflow that, you know, seemed to be the best one. And um, th there was an answer there where somebody suggested, you know, uh, taking a look at Eliza and Alice Bond. And, uh, you know, from that, um, you know, there, there's also references to MegaHal and Rebecca, AIML, and uh, Bot Libre. So um, I started looking at each one of those, and um, they, they all seem to have, um, you know, different, different problems. Uh, some of them, the source code you can't find. Uh, some of them don't compile anymore, and uh, some of them are started free and became commercial. So um, out, out of the whole bunch, though, Alicebot looked the, you know, the most interesting. And uh, this thing was uh, a, a winner in a, um, I, I forget, the, the Liebner Award, you know, where you, where, uh, you try to make it look like it's uh, uh, interacting with a human. But it was like, it won that award like a long time ago, around 2001, you know, so it's like really old. But the interesting thing about it was that it was based on an XML schema uh, called AIML. And um, it, it had an XML object that allowed you to call out, you know, to other programs. And there's lots of documentation on uh, AIML on, on the internet. Um, I couldn't find source for it. But it, uh, the web page is pointed to other implementations. 
So the, the leading candidate, you know, seemed to be Rebecca AIML. And, you know, I started looking at it. It had a lot of good documentation. It claimed to have a lot of nice, nice uh, features. Um, but one thing that caught my attention was they, they changed the license to GPL v3 and commercial. And uh, then there were several real important updates right at the end. And then I, I noticed, you know, a lot of discussion about the 1.1 code, but I couldn't find it anywhere. You, you know, you just can't download it. So the version that's available on SourceForge just does not compile. And so I think some of the updates uh, right there at the end was the author sabotaging it uh, because they were planning to take it commercial. And so, you know, when I looked at what was wrong, uh, there was like exceptions. Uh, you know, where it was like a capital E, and then, you know, it was expecting a, a lowercase e, you know, for the, for the exception. Um, and, you know, as I fixed all those things, then, you know, I ran into other capitalization problems. And so I was like, this, this guy has sabotaged the whole thing, and there's, there's no way I can trust it. Um, so I, I, you know, I asked the author, you know, um, about, you know, these things and whether it ever, you know, compiled in the past, and never, never got an answer. So then I run across this, uh, this thing called Charlix, which uh, you know, I found it based off of the Rep Rebecca AIML project. And it claims to be a, a Linux desktop assistant. Uh, it's only AIML, but it doesn't have any interpreter. Uh, it mentions a bunch of interpreters that it's known to run on, uh, you know, lib AIML, Q AIML, and Rebecca. So Rebecca was crossed off the list. So, you know, but I got two more good leads. Uh, apparently, it was also shipped in QAML at one point, and also PandoraBot. But you know, the thing with PandoraBot is, well, that's a web service, and I'm wanting something on my laptop here. You know, so I, you know, PandoraBot's out of the question also. Um, looking at Charlix also, it was about 2006 era, and very little uh, subsequent work. But it had example um, examples that were excellent. Uh, you know, if you wanted to to look at some very fancy um, AIML coding. So I looked at lib AIML. Uh, the home site died. And uh, I found traces of it on GitHub, GitHub and I found an iPhone assistant uh, based on this thing. So um, once again, another dead end. So then I, I looked at uh, QAIML. You know, it's QT based, it's open source. And finally, it compiles. So th the only bad thing, though, is it comes with a Qt GUI application. And you know, it's set up for networking and client and server. And there's a lot more you know, to it than you know, what I really wanted you know, to, to have um, you know, for something like this. So after looking at all the options for a while, I realized that, well, maybe all I really need is this one file. And it's the AIM, AIML parser.cpp file that you know, I mentioned up here. It actually is the whole AIML implementation. It expects uh, you know, some directories uh, to be structured in a certain way. Um, it has an AIML set, a temp directory, utils, and, um, and include um, you know, for, for header files and things. And inside those, you know, it expects uh, to have AIML files in, in a specific place. Uh, the temp file is, is just for compile time, and then after that, it's not used. Um, the utils directory has two things in it that's, that's of interest, which is a substitutions dictionary and a, uh, a, an XML file that holds the variables that's used by the AML files. Uh, the include directory was, is just where the include is for the AML parser.h. And um, so, you know, I, I was thinking, maybe I can just take this one thing and, you know, build from it. Um, you know, another thing I, I wasn't sure about was it's based on Qt, and I was kind of unsure, you know, about how to how to get a Qt application started, especially if it was going to be console. It, that turned out to not really be a problem, and um, um, so you know, then I was wondering, you know, can a usable shell be made of this for testing? And so this is the only C code I'm going to show you in the whole presentation because this is all that I had to write. You know, to get the get, to get the whole thing working. Now, you'd probably want to add a little more uh, error handling in it, but you know, I just wanted to boil it down to show you it really didn't take much. You know, to make this thing work. Basically, you set up a um, 
rules directory, you know, so, which is going to be used later. Um, you instantiate the parser. You tell it to load the AML rule set out of the rule dir, and then you create standard in and standard out. And then you have the event loop where you read standard in. Um, if it's empty, you you go around the loop again, you know, because somebody's hit the uh, the enter button. And uh, if the input is equal to the done string, then exit. Otherwise, you call the parser and, and get the response, and then you write it to standard out. That is all there is to it. So you know, it's looking looking pretty promising. So getting into AIML, um, this is the basic syntax of, um, of a typical uh, hello world kind of uh, a file. Um, each unit of knowledge is called a category. And then in it, you have a pattern, which is matched on, you know, for input. And then based on that match, then there's a template to formulate an output. So in this particular case, no matter what you type in, it's going to respond with hello world. And you know, this is kind of what the, the grammar tree looks like. It, um, I, I'm showing this just because you know, this is a simple, a simple one, and I'm going to show you a little more complex one in just a minute. So here's a more complicated example. Um, you know, once again, each, each piece is in a category. Uh, there's a pattern to match the input and a template that formulates the, the output. So we, we got, you know, like, what is your name? What is today? And then we have something that's a catch-all at the bottom. So, you know, this, this pattern that's in an asterisk at, at the bottom, uh, it just simply responds, you know, I don't understand. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of important to have a catch-all, you know, in all of, all of the, the AIML that you write, uh, just so that there's something to respond with uh, if, if there's no match. And so this is what the grammar tree looks like for um, something that's a little more complicated. And, and it turns out that AIML, whenever it reads in the files, it breaks it into a, a, a true grammar tree just like this. So that, you know, if you have a thousand rules, then there's going to be a thousand of, of these branches, but it's going to organize everything so that it, it walks this tree until it finds the, the response template that matches it. So there's some other useful tags uh, that, that's in this. Uh, get, uh, so you can retrieve the value of a variable. Set, so you can set something. Then there's a condition uh, tag that's used for uh, branching. Uh, there's a li, which is a line item, uh, and it's used by the condition. So you, know, you can have like a condition, and then different line items, and, and then you, know, you end the condition. Uh, it also has recursion, SRAI. This is like the workhorse of uh, AIML. It's, uh, that one's a really important one. Uh, there's another tag called think. And what that does is that suppresses output. Uh, there's also something called random, which allows you to choose a random uh, response. And system, which is you know, something that's important for this particular thing, since we're wanting to do a security bot, is that it calls external programs. Uh, some not so useful tags that you would you would read about, uh, and you know they they're kind of positioned as being useful, is something called that, which is is used to re refer to a previous sentence. So in other words, if you ask a question like, "Do you want me to to do something?", then you know you're going to have a yes no, and so you would have a pattern matching on yes, and then under that yes you would have a that to remember the question that was asked so that it would find the right template. That turns out to be kind of messy. Uh, there's another one called topic, which is, is used to um, sort of divide the AML top, uh, I guess, patterns into things based on topics. But it turns out to be so exclusionary that it, it really wasn't useful in any of the, uh, the experimenting I was doing with it. So I was thinking with, you know, with this, uh, you know, what, what should we do next? Well, anyway, so, so Data was saying computer, you know, run the fluidic sensor diagnostic. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great, you know, to, ha to have these computers here like this and say, would you run a level five diagnostic on the security system? Okay, so since I work in security, 
uh, what I got to thinking about was, um, you know, these are, these are the kind of areas that uh, a security assistant would need to be aware of and, and think about and, and assist in. Um, you know, the first thing of, is updates, of course. I mean, if your system's not updated, there's security holes. Um, if, if there's any security updates hanging around out there. Uh, you definitely want SE Linux turned on and enforcing. Um, you also want to make sure that the system is configured well based on um, best practices. Uh, you also want to know that uh, the integrity of the system is, is good uh, and nothing's changed because, you know, that could be the sign of uh, Trojan or firewall, I mean, uh, uh, viruses or, or things like that. Uh, you also want to know about listening demons and know that uh, nothing new has popped up. You want to know that the firewall is activated and, and has, has rules running. Uh, you want to know that the audit system is up and running because it's what's going to feed uh, events to the audit logs, which it would then, uh, you know, assistant could use to look for anomalies or suspicious behavior. Um, but you also want to know if anybody's logged in with privileges, because you know, a privileged user could also uh, mess up the security of a system. So, you know, getting back to uh, you know trying to make this thing happen, um, I. Here's a, a little snippet of a, a pattern. So if you typed in SE Linux mode, then what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to run an external command uh, system. It's going to run SE status, and it's going to grip on the mode, and it's going to use awk, and it's going to you know, print the third thing out as the, as the response to this thing. Now, there, another problem that, that I, you know, I had to think about you know, going through this is there's many ways to say the same thing. You know, is SE Linux on? Is it enabled? Is Li SE Linux okay? Is, is it running? Uh, even though SE Linux doesn't really run, per se, uh, people might ask that, you know, because they don't know. Um, you know, looking at the SCAP also, is, is the SCAP scan okay? Is the config okay? Is the configuration okay? You know, there's just lots of different ways to say the same thing. So um, that's one of the things that has to be taken, taken care of. And the way that we do this is by using the, the SRA, SRAI tag to redirect these different variances back to one main item. So, you know, in, in this particular example, if somebody were to ask, is SE Linux enabled, then it's going to redirect it back to, is SE Linux on, which is then going to run this external system command, you know, to give, to give the answer. Okay, so... Something else you know, we had to think about in, in this was remembering that something was done. Like, for example, if we're going to run an SCAP scan, there's really two steps in this process. One is that you run the scan, and then somebody might ask questions about it you know, to, to find out you know, what the results were. They, they may say, you know, has, has the system been scanned? You know, when was it scanned? Is, was it okay? Were there problems? So the way that this is handled um, in, in this assistant is by setting variables. So if we run the SCAP scan, then what we're going to do is we're going to put into the uh, variable SCAP scan the, the output from this, this helper. And the, the helper is, is right down below. Uh, and essentially what it does is it runs the OSCAP utility and it looks at the return code. And based on the return code, it, it gives a pass or fail uh, score. So then, you know, using the results, um, you know, if somebody was to ask the question, you know, has the system been scanned? Then what we want to do is um, put this in a conditional, and we're going to take a look at that value. If, the, if there is no value, then, then we tell it no, otherwise yes. I mean, this is like programming you know, in C, but you know, it's, it's using XML. And sometimes we may want to uh, save scanning the whole system um, you know, whenever we're just answering a bunch of questions. And so you, you have to do ex, uh, conditional execution uh, to prevent you know, constantly scanning a system. Um, and the, the way that this is done, you know, once again, is by recursion, but also by setting variables. Um, so the way that this works is you, you come in at the Boolean SCAP scan, uh, you know, there's the entry point, 
um, there's a condition where it looks to see if that if that thing is set to uh, to null. If 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 it is, then it calls check uh, scap scan, which up at the, up at the top while well, it's in the middle, it conditionally does the scan and uh, calls the the thing that actually executes it. Otherwise, if if it was already scanned, it just it just simply returns uh, the answer. So this, this leads to the ultimate question, you know, that somebody might ask, which is, you know, is this system secure? And so, you know, for, for this one, we're just going to say if there's no updates needed and SE Linux is on and SE Linux is enforcing and if the configuration scan passes and integrity passes and there's no unexpected demons and firewall loaded and then to the best of our knowledge, yes, we're not going to, we're, we're not ever going to say absolutely yes. <laughs> Not in security. <laughs> we'll, we'll say definitely no, but we'll, we won't say absolutely yes. So in order to do that, you know, that's kind of like a waterfall. You know, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if. And so in the XML, there's, there's a way of doing this. And um, it, once again, it involves conditionals. But the thing is, you cannot have nested conditionals in AIML. So what you wind up doing is in, in the first, like looking in the first one, uh, this is going to check uh, to see if there's any updates. Uh, and so, you know, this, this one's going to be called assess one. And this is not something anybody's likely to type in. So, you know, basically what happens is uh, somebody asks if the system is secure, and then it's going to call assess one. And assess one is going to um, go in here and it's going to run the um, Boolean security updates to, to figure out uh, the answer. And it's going to return it into a variable called retval. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set that in the condition and we're going to look and see if the value is yes. If it is, then we're going to set some error variables and, and leave. Otherwise, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have it just to call assess2. And so, you know, the important thing to, to point out in this is that with these line items, you can make it match on a name and a value, but if you look at the one that's in red, it doesn't have a name or a value, so that's like a, like an else statement. And so what that does is that, you know, does recursion into the next one. And, you know, it would, to me it would have been a little easier if they had allowed nested conditions, but they just don't do it, so it, it gets kind of big and wordy and lots of ankle brackets everywhere to, to do this. The other big problem I ran into is it's pretty natural to use the word it in, in English sentences. You know, you might say, is SE Linux enabled? Is it enforcing? And so there, there has to be some sort of tracking of what the current topic is so that you know what the word it refers to. Um, you know, like I said a, a little while ago, the topic tag seems to do absolutely the wrong thing. Uh, this thing, um, just seems to narrow the, you know, all the questions down that, it, that might be uh, part of the answer. Uh, so it's really hard to, to find an exact match and it's, ch it's also hard to, to change topics. So what I decided to do is to create a variable called subject. And this thing would be set, you know, whenever you, you, you do something like you say, is SCAP or is the system configuration okay? There's going to be a couple layers of recursion all the way down until it actually runs a scan. And at that point, it's also going to set this variable so that uh, the topic is now a system configuration. So that if you say later, you know, uh, is the, was the scan OK? Well, that's an, actually, that's another problem I ran into, because there's two different scans. And so I had to track, track the topic down also between scans so that you know whether you're doing an integrity scan or a configuration scan. But, it's, but it's, in a way, it's the same, same problem, is that you've got to track the, the topic, the current topic, so that you can make the, the substitution later. And so, you know, th there was uh, a couple variables that, that this thing was using. Um, you know, there's the subject, which, you know, it could have the value of updates, SE Linux, SCAP scan, integrity, audit, ports, firewall, anomalies. And that way, you know, whenever you use the word it, it would know how to, um, it would know what topics have been referred to, and it would use the SRAI to rewrite the question and insert the current subject into the right spot. So that if you said, was the scan okay, it would rewrite that as, 
is the SCAP scan okay or is the integrity scan okay? But that would all happen in the recursion so that the user wouldn't know that was happening. There, there was also a variable tracking problem so that like, for, for example, if you asked if the, um, if the system was secure, as it walked through that, that tree, it would uh, update the problem variable with wherever it stopped so that you could ask if anything was wrong and it would know exactly, you know, which section of the tree, you know, the questions are about. Okay, so, you know, the next thing that you want a security system to do is when it finds problems, you want it to fix problems. So, th there was a bunch of uh, things around fix also uh, that, that needed to be uh, fixed up here. Um, you might type in, can you, you know, can you fix the, the problem? And so what it would have to know is, you know, the variable from before, you know, problem, so it would rewrite it as, can you, you know, fix security updates or, um, you know, let me see, in this particular case, it, it uh, recursed into apply security updates and, um, you know, this is what it, what it eventually did, is, is it calls yum under the, under the hood. Okay, so let me see something here. Let me just break this thing out and let you see see the program. Um, so you can type in stuff like what topics do you know? And so it gives you a hint, you know, of, of the things that's currently programmed uh, to handle. Um, So it can, you know, give you give you the information. <laughs> Maybe. The question is, do I take re take requests? Uh, we'll get to a variation on that in just a minute. Are there? Yeah. Uh, so here's the catch-all coming into uh, our I think this is a little more successful because it's taking time to answer. Shouldn't have took that long. I wonder if uh, Fedora's pushed out some new updates. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I had uh, downloaded everything in the cache, so I guess, I guess Fedora must have pushed something. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, most of the time it comes right back, you know, when it's running out of cash. I don't know if this thing's even on the network, so it's probably not doing good. Uh, we'll, we'll move along. Let's see. I bet that's going to... See if that makes makes it happier. Well, let's let's just well. Our well, 
Oh, there you go. Okay, so it's, it's, it's happier now. Okay, uh, so updates is, is working good. And so now it's, it's running an SCAP scan based on the Fedora content. Fig problems. Okay. Let me see what else we got here. Now the big one. Oh. Okay. Well, I guess it's uh One last time here. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I am I'm trying to think what what this thing could be doing wrong because it was all working um, real well so a little while ago. Um, Yeah, I can show. I can definitely show the rules. The other thing too, I was going to mention is that um, this thing also has a has a debug log, uh, you know, that can can help, um, you know, when you're trying to find rule matching. Um, that was a nice feature, you know, that the QAML author uh, put into it. But you know, this in this particular one, there's nothing in the debug log. Um, just to let me see if we can do this um, security bot. Uh, so. Yeah. Ah, uh, here's here's the problem. Is, is there there's an error in the. Uh, in the fix AML file. The I need. It should work. Now this will work. Uh, 
Okay, this is what I expected. Although it should be running out of cash, it's okay. So now is the system secure? No, this is my personal one. <laughs> so, I think I'm going to quit while I'm ahead on this one. Right, uh, that's okay. So you know, to to do the rest of what I would really like this to do, you really want to add real time sensing, and to this end, I added a function called set var, you know, to the uh, to the parse, you know, AIML parser uh, class, and this way, you know, an, another thread could set a variable to communicate with the main program. Um, one of the other problems that you may run into is uh, you might be trying to give a presentation and you're, you know, you fat finger things in. And so there's the substitutions. And so, you know, based on your, your habits, you might go make uh, substitutions that, that caused you problems. So to add voice to this, there is, a, since this is a QT application, uh, KDE has a Simon speech recognition engine, which I believe is a play on words, you know, Simon says. Um, and the output for this thing could be uh, called, you know, using a uh, festival. So the next time that you use your Google thing and you say, what is the weather in Miami? And it gives you text instead of speech. Well, you know what the technology is behind it because I'm sure Google has a large number of, of these AML uh, tags, you know, Taking these things and redirecting them and and sending them out and and, and gathering the information up and uh, spitting them back out, so it's not such a mystery after all. You know this is how a lot of this is done today. Any questions? Yes. So I guess the question is, is it better to limit the user on, on input um, than to let them ask anything? And I, in a way, I, I think yes, but if you want to do hands-free, the people might ask anything. And so that's where I was really going with this, was looking at the emo spark you know, that caused this whole investigation. It was a voice-only interface. And so that that's what i was trying to to replicate but i just didn't have time to glue it together with the the simon and festival so any other questions yes Yeah, you, you could, you know, I guess the comment was that, um, you know, this could, could be an enhancement for something like cockpit. And I guess it would, you know, like if you're busy typing on something, you probably could ask a question, you know, verbally and have the computer look it up and tell you the answer. You know, and it's very Star Trek-like. I mean, you wouldn't see data typing. He would say, computer, you know, what's the status on this? I 
I think there may be some down below, but if you notice, there wasn't um, much use of asterisks in, in the, the text. Well, anyways, time is out, and um, you know, we can talk about this uh, later in the hall or something else. All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs>